Welcome to the Take the North podcast. I'm David Haw from 670 The Scores, Mully and Haw Show, Dan Weeders from the Chicago Tribune, and we are here on your free Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can watch us on 670 The Scores' YouTube page, and we are here to answer your questions. It's mailbag time, Dan. Let's go. I love it. Uh, there's a, a lot flooding in the mailbox, and I know Studs is here to to Studs works. It. I mean, morning, noon, and night, rain, sleet, snow, or shine. What, what is that the saying about mailmen? That's Studs. He delivers whatever we ask him to deliver, and he will be here with our mailbag shortly as he arrives. There he is. Wait, there he is on time, <laughs> like the Amazon delivery guy. What's up, Studs? What do we got? Hey, guys. How's it going? All right. So we'll go ahead and start with a, a nice – note from our guy i don't know if you guys remember this guy but i i brought to you last year a listener we have in argentina i do yes and his name is gonzalo so he wrote back again and it's a kind of a, a long email but the, we get to the the crux of this and his question is what are the chances that they can manage to get both Caleb Williams at number one, which is kind of presumptive at this point, and Odunze at number nine. So what do you guys think about that matchup? And shout out to Gonzalo. Thanks for thanks for continuing to listen down there in Argentina. Dan, you can go first. And yeah, thank you to Gonzalo. We really appreciate you listening down there. Th this number nine pick, guys, is set up to be awesome with however they choose to use it. And that's what's so cool about it is it gives them so much flexibility to either add a playmaking receiver, to either add an offensive tackle that can come in and start on day one, to add a pass rusher to go on the opposite side of Montez Sweat. I could not be more enthused for the number of different options Ryan Poles has, including the possibility if somebody wants to come up to number nine for somebody of trading back, getting a guy in the mid-teens and then taking somebody else elsewhere in the draft that, that helps you build capital. To the specific question about Adunze, I love it. If it's there, this is one of those guys that you talk to a lot of Italian evaluators and they just love his ability to make contested catches. They love the wiring, his ability to, to, to be an everyday, get better sponge. Uh, and so if you were able to, to pair him up, not only with Caleb Williams, but with DJ Moore and Keenan Allen, who, by the way, is here on a one-year deal, what an absolutely wonderful uh, low expectation, high reward potential for a rookie to come into. Um, I think it's possible. I do think it's possible, particularly with the, the, the increasing likelihood that there's going to be four quarterbacks off the board before we get to number nine. I think that's a good projection with the four quarterbacks because J.J. McCarthy, depending on how people view his pro day performance, will jump into the top 10. Then you talk about the tackles, good year for offensive tackles. If all is off the board, to me, this makes the most sense. If Roma Dunze is there, and maybe even if all is on the board, I, I would have to wait and see. But I guess I would prioritize it this way. Assuming all it isn't there, Roma Dunze would be who I would jump at. I couldn't get the card to the, the podium quickly enough so they can announce Roma Dunze is a Chicago Bear. You pair him with Caleb Williams in terms of this growth together. You have Chicago's version. You have Chicago's version of Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, potentially. You have that kind of you know, symmetry with the rookies. You have that kind of chemistry, perhaps. Now, they don't have a, a previous relationship, but they do have a, a PAC-12 uh, connection. Maybe they are um, – they, they would be a dynamic duo uh, to grow with. And the pressure would not be on a Dunze to perform from day one, so that wouldn't be too bad. And he could learn from Keenan Allen what a, and, and DJ Moore. What better veterans to learn from? Now, the conversation will also revolve, and I hear people already reacting to it. Well, what if you have a chance to take the number one defensive player off the board? Because if these scenarios fall into place, there's not going to be a defensive player off the board when the Bears are on the clock at number nine. That's also very enticing. But I would prioritize that third. I would go, you know, if Joe Walt is there, I could see Ryan Poles going with the offensive tackle. Oh, yeah. He's unlikely to be there, so I could see them going Roma Dunze, who is probably going to be there. And if both are gone – unlikely but if both are gone then you still might be in a position to take the number one defensive player off the board all right and just one last quick thing from gonzalo because i because I, I know you guys will appreciate this he says he's tired of going through the most exciting part of the Bears season between march and august year after year this is a good thing it, the good thing is it finally seems that it's beginning to slide into november through january so shout out hallelujah gonzalo. hallelujah <laughs> gonzalo i hope we can get there 
That's <laughs> that's reading Dan's notes. I, I think, <laughs> but I think I think it's a great point. You know, it, at some point in time, the regular season has to be as compelling as the off season. Seriously, and and for the Bears. That hasn't been the case since 2018, and before that, it wasn't the case. You go back even more uh, to 2012, 2010. I mean, so it's been way too long since regular season games have mattered, before, since January has been relevant, and uh, too many coaching searches, too many coordinator searches. Yeah, I agree with that. That's a great letter. All right, and so we'll, we'll move over to, over to Twitter for our next one. So at, at Take the North Pod on Twitter – and this is a, a similar theme, but a little, but for, but at a, a different angle on the number nine pick. It's from Ed Helensky, who has a both an American and a Polish flag in his in his <laughs> name there. So shout out to my Polish brethren. Brethren, he says, how about this draft Bears draft strategy? Moving down from number nine in the first round to snag a second round pick in the draft. This way, they keep two picks in the first, get a second, and don't have to wait for the number seventy five pick in the third round. Go ahead, it Dan. depends. On, yeah, it depends on how far you're going to go down. If you're going to get a two, but you can at least get, you know, maybe a three or a four by going down far enough. Listen, like if, if the board breaks in a way where someone wants to come and knock on your door for the number nine pick, and you see a pool of players that that you believe can be helpful to you, not only with that pick that you trade down to, but with the additional one you pick up, I'm all for it because we've talked about it. This offensive tackle class is loaded. Great. This wide receiver class, uh, even beyond the top three, the, the Harrison Jr., the Odunze, uh, and, and Malik Neighbors, you've got Brian Thomas Jr. that could fall into the mid to low teens. You could get a difference-making weapon there and then still add draft capital later in the draft. Um, I, I Listen, I love the idea. I would also just be uh, forward and saying it takes two to tango, so someone's going to have to come up to nine and want to come up to nine for you to make that happen. And number two, you have to make sure that one of the guys that you're deeply in love with, with the potential number nine pick target, isn't still there because I always hate passing on guys that you're deeply in love with just to add more cash. Well, I love – I love the idea that draft Knicks want the bears to accumulate draft capital. They have four picks. There's not a lot of draft capital, but I also look at the bears and what do we, what have we said consistently about their team as they have missed the playoffs one year after the other, they don't have enough difference makers. They don't have enough blue players. They don't have enough pro bowl caliber players. And if you're picking in the top 10, you got a pretty good shot. I mean, the, the metrics of percentages, you can go back and do the math and, and cite the, the reference. I don't have it in front of me, but you're more likely to find a Pro Bowl caliber player in your top 10 than maybe 10 to 20 and 20 to 30. And so while I respect the, the, the desire to get more than four picks, it also as this comes up, and it will come up well, maybe every day between every morning between 5.30 and 10 uh, until draft day, you know, the the it's not always the quantity it, it has to be the quality and and the bears are in a position to get two players in the yeah. top 10 that are difference makers so you have to also keep in mind uh, they turned a fourth round pick into keenan allen they took a second round pick into montez sweat they turned a fifth round pick into ryan bates those are de facto draft picks part of this draft class in terms of what your capital purchased you those are investments yeah. in the 2024 draft class so i would be inclined to stay where i am take the impact guy and take my chances all right guys we'll stay on twitter and this one is we're finally going to get to a more quarterback themed question here good we haven't this, talked about the quarterback all month yeah, we never, we never talk about the quarterback good. yeah this is finally right so this is from Pat Moran on Twitter. Again, at Take the North Pod on Twitter. Do you see the Bears signing an experienced vet to back up Caleb, or are they content with Bajent as the backup? Go ahead. I love this question. I love this question because I brought it up a couple days ago on the Mullion Haw Show, and I think it's one of the areas, if I'm prioritizing needs that the Bears still have after the first couple waves of free agency, Certainly edge rusher, opposite Montez Sweat. Certainly three technique tackle for depth or a replacement of Justin Jones. But I think we haven't really been talking about the backup quarterback. And I'm not impressed with Brett Rippon. And I would have some level of concern with Tyson Bajan. 
And I'm one of the co-founders of the Bajancy. I have the sweatshirt to prove it. I love the kid. I love everything about his story. It's a terrific tale. But if you're looking at this season as a playoff season, and I think Matt Eberflus has to, as we've established, I wonder about the wisdom of going into the year with Caleb Williams being one injury away from having your hopes derailed or your path kind of redirected because maybe Tyson Bajan is or isn't up to the task. I'd, I'd prefer somebody who has been there and done that. I don't know if Ryan Tannehill is that guy. I don't know if Carson Wentz is that guy. But I would explore those possibilities with the rep representatives, and I would want to know who else might be on the scrap heap to come in and play the role of Joe Flacco if he has to. So that's a great, that's a great question because it's something that I do think tends to get overlooked at all this hype over Caleb Williams, understandable hype, but backup quarterback's an important role in any team. My flight for Orlando leaves on Saturday night. I, it is in the margins of my notebook in red pen to ask about QB2. I want to know what the vision is there. I want to know what the Brett Ribbon signing was all about. I want to know what the Bears are doing to, to – Fortify the depth chart at the most important position on the roster. Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus owe us some sort of answer on that topic, and I'm certain that they will give it to us uh, next week at the league meetings. And so, uh, fascinating question. There is this thought process that you would love to have a veteran to help a rookie quarterback along. I love it when that option is there for you. There are guys that are really good at that. Mark Sanchez, as I've mentioned before, was great in terms of helping Mitch Trubisky uh, along through his his rookie season you see this all the time where uh you know look justin fields had andy dalton nick Foles. he had two guys now josh lucas has been on record and saying that didn't go as smoothly as the bears wanted it to and that there was a little friction in the room because of that but you would like to have that and right now i just don't know that that's there now brad biggs always says that look like how many guys do you need coaching your quarterback you already have Shane Waldron as your offensive coordinator. You already have Thomas Brown as your passing game coordinator. You have Kerry Joseph as your quarterback's coach. You have uh, Ryan Griffin as an offensive assistant in charge of quarterbacks. So there's four coaches that are already going to have their eyes in that in that room. I just want to hear from from the people that are running the show there what the vision is and 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 why Brett Rippon was signed because I, I I can't quite figure out what the attraction there was uh, when you're bringing in a rookie quarterback that could use a lot of help. Because Tyson Bajan's guy was Luke Getze, who discovered him at the Senior Bowl. You wonder if Matt Eberflus was the guy he won over, and you wonder if Ryan Poles is the guy that still believes in Bajan, because right now, he's your backup. I think Rippon is the third guy learning everybody's names. He spent 25 days with Shane Waldron, and that was not long enough to justify you know, giving him a roster spot. I think he's in to kind of ease the transition, but I don't view him as a viable number two option. And as Studs knows, Luke Getze is still in jail and not eligible for, for parole for another three <laughs> years because of his uh, because of the crimes he committed against the, the Chicago Bears offense. All right, he's, on to the next time. So, uh, all right, we got another one. We, we got just a couple more here, I think, guys. So this one sure. is a probably a little uh, uh, a quicker one, I would I would guess, unless there's something crazy here. But this is from a great name on Twitter, Gridiron Assassin. Why didn't the great Ryan Bates get a press conference at Hallis Hall like most of the other new acquisitions? I will take this one because it is a quick and easy answer. The other new acquisitions had to come in the building to sign the paperwork that made their contracts uh, property of the Chicago Bears. Ryan Bates was a trade acquisition so he did not have to come sign the actual papers to make himself a Chicago Bear and so he didn't have to be there in person to stand up in front of the media there was nothing more to it than that but it's a good question and so that's why so we'll have to wait uh until probably mid-May before Chicago uh gets to hear from Ryan Bates for the first time have we heard from Coleman Shelton yet have we heard from him did he, he speak was, to the media he, he did he did indeed speak to the media sorry you missed that I he, don't remember that. Spoke, I think he spoke either on Friday or Saturday. So it was, it was either the day Friday. before or the day. Yeah. So it was the day before Justin Fields was traded. So and the, and the day after Keenan and the day after Keenan Allen was acquired. Exactly. So it yeah. was easy to lose the Coleman <laughs> Shelton six minute press conference at the Hallis Hall Dais in, in the shuffle. I'm just fascinating. The grid grid gridiron assassin is out there feeling like this offseason full of great moves, <laughs> smart decisions is incomplete because he we have yet to hear from the great Ryan Bates. I mean, 
mean, what can an offensive lineman say in I, the middle of March that is going to satisfy the fan base? But maybe that is the missing element to this offseason. Still a valid question, and thankfully we got a good yes. answer for that. That's great. <laughs> Love you. All right, so this one's this one's back on our email, and it's from – and so the email uh, again is take the north pod at gmail.com. It's from Jacob Croft Craft. Excuse me. I was thinking Laura, Laura Croft, like the video game. And uh, so this is Jacob's question. Are Bears fans underrating Caleb Williams? It seems like a lot of fans are so obsessed with fields. They haven't paid attention to how great of an opportunity this is for the franchise. They have the number one overall pick in a draft where that number one QB would be the top QB in most drafts. Fans should be on cloud nine. Jacob, I think that's a really insightful question. I I think that I have been accused of going the other way and being too uh, over the top in terms of optimism and enthusiasm for Caleb Williams because I like what I've seen on tape. I really liked him as a college quarterback if it, going back to when he was making his Heisman Trophy run I just loved I've always loved watching USC football but but I also felt like he has that special quality that I think Bears fans are going to enjoy for years to come so I think it's a valid point I, I think the fascination with the Justin Fields career and grading the flashes and falling in love with the highlights and that's going to be something we talk about for a long time because uh, his legacy is is, is one of <laughs> unfulfilled potential, but also of great achievement individually. He was a great running back. He was a special runner as a quarterback, but I never have understood why people haven't seen what we're describing, that there was there was something missing in the passing game. I would think Bears fans would be thrilled with the ability to upgrade at a position they have never been able to, to master. It's been historically cursed. We talked about it today. To uh, or on the Mullen Haw show, and I compared it to the you know before it used to be in Chicago. There was always the Cubs futility. The Cubs were cursed, and then 2016 happened. Cubs aren't cursed. They're going to have sustained success, and they're back in it this year as a favorite in the NL Central. And that's what you want. And to me, Caleb Williams can be the 2016 Cubs to the Bears quarterback position because he can be the guy that ends the the longing, the curse, and he is like what everybody else and every other great team has, a franchise quarterback. And Bears fans should be excited about that. And that's independent of whatever people felt about Justin Fields. This kid's going to deliver. And until he doesn't, I'm going to believe that. Studs gave us a good question there. And my answer would just be that some Bear fans are underrating Caleb Williams. Some are overrating him. And then there's a big portion of people in the middle uh, that, that don't scream as loud as the others who, who probably have this in the proper perspective, understanding what a golden opportunity this is. I want to just put this on record because it's just worth reiterating one more time. I was very appreciative of who Justin Fields was over his three years here. I think he handled himself with great maturity. He was a pro. We understand why the guys in the locker room loved him as much as they did because he did a lot of things the right way. What he didn't do was produce consistently enough. And so I've had a, a, a really fascinating experience watching this conversation get twisted the way it has, particularly since the season ended, where you have Chase Daniel on multiple platforms this week calling Justin Fields an icon. Never threw for 3,000 yards, never got to 20 touchdown passes. If Justin Fields is an icon, this city is going to lose its mind the first time Caleb Williams has, you know, three 300-yard games in a five-game span. And believe me, that day is coming. So um, to, to answer the question directly, like all love for Justin, I hope he gets his feet on the ground quickly in Pittsburgh and, and has a, a great career going forward. But my goodness, like this is an opportunity you can't pass on. And, and like, I just, I, I don't know that the city is quite prepared for what high level quarterback production feels like, and it may be coming here. And yet there's a portion of the fan base that's resistant to it. It's amazing. All right. We got time for one more studs. Okay, so there there is one that I think we need to save for another episode because I think it's really intuitive and uh, will will require more time than we have. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm bookmarking that one for later. This one is another one from our email. It's from EJ Ward. Take the North Pod at gmail.com. He loves the pod, which is awesome. And this one should be, I think, quick for you guys. I haven't heard you guys address the bowl game in which USC's backup quarterback, Miller Moss, lit it up. I guess by not addressing it, it means it's a non-issue, but it would still appreciate your comments. 
We got a call on this on the Mullen Hall show too, and and I I'm going to handle this better here than I did on the air on Wednesday because I was overly dismissive of the caller, and I, I'm sorry about that. And I was a little defensive because I just thought it was a ridiculous question. <laughs> I still think it's a ridiculous question, but I'm going to be a little bit more professional in how I answer it. You can't watch Caleb Williams at Oklahoma and at USC winning the Heisman Trophy, all that he does off platform, off schedule, improvising, and then in the pocket. You can't watch all of the things that he has done to put himself in this position and convince me and try to make the claim that he's a system quarterback. And when you talk about Miller Moss succeeding in the USC offense, and boy, in Caleb Williams' absence, this kid did a nice job in the bowl game. So that suggests that you're going to take that to think anybody could have done what Caleb Williams could have done. I am going to be in full scoff mode. I'm resisting that right now. You can tell I'm talking slowly. I'm trying to be very measured. But I think it's ridiculous because Caleb Williams is the furthest thing from a system quarterback that we have seen in this draft in many years. So, no, I don't think that Miller Moss's success has anything to do with Caleb Williams' potential. I think it's a fair question because I think there is probably some curiosity about, okay, why was it so easy for a guy who hadn't played all year to come in and, and light it up? Well, Lincoln – Riley runs a pretty good offense and in a bowl game where uh, you don't know who's playing on, on either side, sometimes things happen. And so like there, there it was a notable uh, data point for certain, but I think you laid it out perfectly there through the eyes of people in the NFL who have watched the tape, who have watched the 2022 Heisman trophy winning season that Caleb Williams had, who have watched him really since the, 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 the late days of high school and understand that there's just a skill set here that's different. Um, you'll see it. You'll see it up close and personal. You saw some of it at the pro day. You see the efficiency of movement. You see the ability to put the ball where it needs to go. Um, it, it's different. Oh, by the way, the Lincoln Riley system has produced other number one pick quarterbacks. And I know they're not the stars that are leading uh, Lombardi trophy runs, but it's not like Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray are trash. You know, no. like, oh, both of these guys have gotten second contracts and got, gotten paid and have established themselves as, as difference making playmakers at times. And so it's not like, Oh, you know, it's just Lincoln Riley and then these guys can't play. And so Caleb Williams is probably the best of the bunch. Um, and so it's up to him now to, to, to validate the hype. And that's, that's going to be the hardest challenge he has is living up to the lofty expectations that have been laid out for him and by him. Baker Mayfield has planted his flag as a franchise quarterback in Tampa. Kyler Murray, when he gets off the video games, has been a very good quarterback. And, no, that's not fair. But Kyler Murray and, and Baker Mayfield, very good examples. And I just don't think that I, – I, you said that you think Caleb Williams can be better than both guys. You think yeah. he can be better than both guys? Yeah. I think he can be. Yeah. He, he okay. better be. <laughs> well, he better be. I mean, Kyler Murray before the injury was a guy that you could feel very good about. He got the big contract. I think I had fewer concern. I had I had more concerns probably about Baker Mayfield. I wasn't never a big Baker Mayfield guy, but fair question. Okay, I don't want to. It, it was a fair question. I think it needs to be addressed, and I think we addressed it. But Caleb Williams isn't a system quarterback. No, no shot. No, no chance there. Um, no, good questions, though. I'm done. glad we got some interaction. Thanks, thanks with for them. thanks for regathering yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like Thanks for that. regathering yourself and, and making our readers feel good, our audience feel good. I'm, I'm trying. I'm learning. I'm learning a lot of discipline after. <laughs> listen, you take some of the calls that we have taken uh, on uh, on a regular <laughs> weekday morning, and you try to learn discipline, or else you'll drive yourself crazy. Um, okay. Well, that'll do it for our mailbag episode of the Take the North podcast. Keep those letters coming at, at it uh, at Take the North Pod on Twitter or Take the North Pod at Gmail. Dot com. I think that's the correct email address. It's all on our Twitter feed. You can check it out and we can move on and do the next time because we'll have uh, plenty of things to discuss. It's been a great off season so far. So for Adam Sadzinski, our mailman and Dan Weeder from the Chicago Tribune, I'm David Hall. Thank you for listening to the Take the North podcast. Great talk. See you out there.